Good morning. Welcome to worship with Metropolitan Community Church of Portland. Whether you're joining us here on site or worshiping with us online, we are delighted to share this Sunday morning time with you. If you are worshiping with us at home or some other location other than here and you had a, have a candle available, I'd invite you to light your candle as I light ours and we begin our time of worship together in prayer. God, we are grateful. We are grateful this morning. We are grateful this moment to be in the presence of one another, whether in body or in spirit, but moreover, to be reminded that we are always in your presence. Your presence always dwells with us. God, we pray that your spirit and your presence reach us where we are, that you might reach and fulfill and touch our deepest need for connection, for inspiration, that we might receive the gift that you are prepared to give to us in this moment. Bless our time of worship. In your holy name and in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome again. I'm Reverend Nathan Meckley, pronouns he, him, his, and I have the honor of being the pastor of MCC Portland and the delight of welcoming you to our worship and so many other things with MCC Portland. Again, whether you're worshiping with us online or on site, we are sincerely glad that you're with us here today. I want to share just a few things up front to remind folks that may need reminding or to tell folks for the very first time if they're with us for the first time today. If you are worshiping either online or wherever you are, I encourage you to use our worship hub Online, you can scan the QR code. If you're online, you can use the link provided. And that takes you to a web page that gives you all kinds of resources that can enhance your worship experience. It will provide all of the texts that we're using in worship. If you want to print them up, print them out, or have them on your screen. Links for your offering. Also, links to the online connection card, which I encourage you to complete. And you can use all of those online resources, whether you're here in the room or at home or elsewhere. If you're worshiping with us online, again, I'm so glad that you're joining us. You are as important to us. You are a part of our community as much as anyone who is on site. And I do want to encourage you to complete the online connection card. Let us know that you were here. Give us your contact information if that would be new to us or if it's changed in any way. And the connection card is also a perfect way to share your prayers with our prayer team. Again, you'll find links to make your online offering at this time during this worship or at any time. And if you plan to worship with us again in the future online, I do encourage you to have a candle ready so that you can light your candle as we light ours. And we celebrate communion every Sunday in MCC. So wherever you are, I encourage you to have some bread or some cup available so that we can share that united in spirit, even if we're apart from one another in body. So if you're worshiping online with us, take a moment, say hello if you've not yet done so in the comment section. Let us know we're here, connect with one another while I share a few words for those who are on site and in the room. Hello on site and in the room. A reminder that, yes, 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 yes. Uh, just a reminder that when we are here, we are still observing all of the health guidelines that are necessary during COVID-19. We do ask everyone, regardless of vaccination status, to mask while they're here. When we're up front and speaking from a distance, I will remove my mask, but I do put it back on when I'm seated. Also, all of the things that are available online, we have a version of those available in the room. You can, of course, use the Worship Hub, but your connection card you'll find near you, in front of you somewhere. I do urge you to complete that. If we are new to you, or you are new to us, however that works out, and or if reminder, as I often do, we do have a welcome card that tells you a little bit about how we do things here at MCC Portland. And one of the things in the room, not only can you make your offering online, you can also use the offering plate that's found in the center aisle or the donation station that's found in the lobby. Look at my notes. Last and never least, 
I do want to remind you that here at MCC Portland, we welcome children of all ages to join us anytime, and we do provide supervised child care. And we have introduced her before, but this is her first official Sunday, is Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Natalie and Joy, who are, who's very familiar to us, they will be job sharing our supervised child care, so we're delighted to have Natalie with us, and we'll be seeing more of her, as well as Joy, when she comes to provide that care. So again, if you have children in your life, in your household, or in your extended family, we welcome them here at MCC Portland any time that we are gathered. I think that is enough for me at the moment. So I'd encourage those of us in the room, rise as you're able, and first turn and greet those who are worshiping with us online. We're so glad to have you with us. And take a moment and share a greeting with one another. great to see all you smiling faces. I mean, imagine seeing your smiling faces here. Now let's sing. Yeah, right. Just draw a face on your mask, uh, however you need to do that. Uh, sing with me, won't you? Take my life, God, let it be consecrated faithfully. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my spirit, let it move at the impulse of your love. Take Jesus to Calvary 
This reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. For I received from the sovereign what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup also, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Today could be a few different celebrations, a few different observances, but today I want to take this time and recognize and acknowledge and celebrate that in many churches around the world, this is celebrated as World Communion Sunday. It's an annual observance that happens on the first Sunday in October and it's held in many churches around the world. And it's a celebration and acknowledgement of unity of the global Christian movement around the world. And it encourages participation in that central act of Christian 
community, which is communion. And it's a celebration that I will admit I haven't often seen given much attention in MCCs, and I haven't often paid much attention to it in MCC, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. First, World Communion Sunday is especially encouraged in Protestant traditions that don't celebrate communion weekly, as we in MCC do and other Protestant churches. And second, the first Sunday in October has competition with some other important celebrations. One of them is the Feast of St. Francis, where we, which, is a, which is celebrated on the 4th of October, and we tend to do a blessing of animals, which will be coming this coming Saturday. We're going to do that on Saturday rather than today or tomorrow. And also, it tends to be the first Sunday closest to the observance of the founding of metropolitan community churches globally. MCC was founded on October 6th in 1968. This year, in three days, MCC will be 51 years old. So, happy upcoming. Is my math not right? 50? Please don't ever ask me to do math publicly. 53. Oh, math. Okay. <laughs> Good grief. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Rewind. <laughs> Three days from now, MCC will be 53 years old. Woohoo! Okay. World Communion Sunday was initiated in a long time ago, eh, not long necessarily in church history, but in 1933. And it was initiated in, uh, by the community of Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Actually, had visited Shadyside uh, Presbyterian Church at times of my childhood because I grew up north of Pittsburgh. And just think about it, in 1933, in an industrial city in the United States, during one of the hardest years of the Depression, with the gathering clouds of Nazism and fascism, threatening and gathering across Europe and the world, this community chose as a response, in some ways as a resistance to those forces, to do something symbolic and real. At a time where nation states, politics, and economic crises divided people the followers of Jesus in that community, the presence of Christ in the world, were urged to show unity in protest of those divisions through sharing the presence of Christ in the bread and cup of communion. Now, World Communion Sunday is not quite universally celebrated. But over more than those 80 years, it has grown in importance in many traditions. And in our own time right now, where we are experiencing global crises, economic crises, and divisiveness of a scale that few of us can remember in our lifetimes, those moments where we recognize and claim and celebrate spiritual unity with others around the world is indispensable. And I mentioned October 6th, this coming Wednesday, is also the anniversary of the founding of MCC, October 6th, 1968. And on that date, 53 years ago, 12 people gathered in the living room of a pink house in Huntington Park, California. Troy Perry, the founder of MCC, preached they sang hymns along to recordings of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Or so the story goes. And they celebrated communion with an open invitation. Now, the importance of communion in MCC somehow confounds logic in some ways. Being 53 years old, MCC is not an old church tradition, 
It was founded to reach out and serve particular people whom the church had underserved and not welcomed, lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer people at that time, and even still. Unlike other longer standing religious communities, we weren't founded because we had particular theological argument around other issues, and it has allowed for a great deal of internal theological diversity in, in metropolitan community churches, which some of us find a great gift and others find a great consternation. And like and unlike other traditions, we don't engage in wars over what does or doesn't happen at the communion table. What kind of bread is used, whether there is gluten or not, usually there's both in most of our church, most of our MCCs. Now the cup, whether it's grape juice, fermented or unfermented, almost always unfermented, is offered in MCCs. Because we in MCC long ago decided that that is God's job and not ours to figure that all out. We do say that God is present, but if you ask us why or exactly how, how in this or that, our answer is, oh, just come taste and see and figure it out for yourself. God is here. That's God's job, not ours. Now, I've been in MCC for nearly 40 years. Yes, I was a mere child, obviously, when I started attending. And I have been intimately involved with seven different MCC congregations in those years. And I have visited dozens of other MCCs in five different countries on three different continents. Now that's not to brag, but I have seen a breadth of MCC. And what I can say is, while all of them are different, you will not find any two MCCs exactly alike. And even though communion is often done similarly, it can be done in very different ways around the world. And this uniquely powerful encounter we experience in communion and MCC is still the same. Wherever you go, however it is celebrated, there is something about MCC communion. It's in our spiritual DNA. Now, MCC is not the only church that practices open communion. Praise God. MCC is not the only church that celebrates open communion. We, however, seem to know its transformative power in a way. Somehow the soul of MCC is uniquely gripped by the power of open communion. Now, we may differ in our opinions about what happens to the bread and the cup, what it means to affirm its power in our lives. It's a power that's amplified because of our, I sometimes call it, our aggressively open communion at MCCs. Because I think so many that ex come to an MCC have experienced exclusion, have experienced being turned away, an experience of being not worthy enough somehow, or have been taught to believe that God doesn't welcome them as their authentic selves. Now, Troy Perry came from a Pentecostal background. Church of God of Prophecy was his childhood background. And weekly communion or Eucharist or Lord's Supper, whatever language one would use, celebrated weekly was not a regular part of Troy Perry's upbringing or his background. And his tradition would not have had what we would call a, quote, a high theology of communion. Now, he had prepared in advance of that first service to have communion, but he decided spontaneously in the moment to extend that as an open invitation to everyone, all 12 of the people in the room. Still, then, a very rare experience. It was a movement of the Holy Spirit, which was not from his tradition but responding to the movement of the Holy Spirit was his tradition. So this is a practice that has happened uninterrupted in every MCC for 53 years now in more than 200 churches in nearly 40 countries around the world. Weekly communion open to all 
is in fact the only worship practice that is specifically prescribed in our denominational bylaws. We can set pretty much everything aside or decide locally what happens in worship, but every MCC must celebrate communion weekly. It's central to who we are. Another long introduction to a shorter sermon. So on World Communion Sunday, and a few days ahead of MCC's global anniversary, I want to turn our attention to the very familiar words that we hear in some version or another every week. The words that Wave read for us a few minutes ago. And moreover, I want to take a moment and pay attention to the context in which those words arose. So today we heard from the first letter of Paul to the church in Corinth. And it may be surprising to, to know for the first time or to be reminded that the most commonly used words and formula for the words of institution, as we call them, at the communion table are not from the Gospels, but from a letter of Paul. Yes, Mark and Matthew and Luke all recount that scene of the Last Supper where Jesus takes bread and cup and shares it with his friends and followers. And they are all similar. There are differences among them. But it's Paul's version of the story, the version that Paul would have learned after his conversion when he studied at the feet of the first generation of Jesus' followers in Jerusalem and his letter, which was written before any of the other Gospels were written. My first, my, my seminary New Testament professor, professor said, these words of Paul are among the closest to the what's called the ipsissimo verba of Jesus, the actual words, because there are fewer, there are fewer dots to connect to the original people who were at the Last Supper. But that's just a little whatever. Ipsissimo verba, original words, Paul's version of communion may be the most authentic that we have recorded in scripture. Let's take a breath if that is unsettling to you spiritually. Okay, okay. It has become the model for communion. And as important as these words may be, some traditions say you must say them exactly in a very particular way and you cannot omit or change any of those words. Thankfully, that's not MCC's tradition. So I want to take back and look at the words in their context. Paul's letter to the church in Corinth is actually one that is pretty familiar to us. And it was in part written as a response to a letter they had sent to him asking him questions about how to do things. We've got questions that are coming up in our community. We've got arguments coming up in our community. Would you please tell us what to do about them? It was also a letter where Paul took the opportunity to tell them what he had heard was going on, not just what they said was going on, but reports that he had heard about the life of their community. So we have one side of a conversation, Paul's side of the conversation, his letters. And we get a glimpse of what some of the problems were. And the first and biggest problem that Paul points out in this letter to the church in Corinth was this. Paul, who had planted the church, he was a church planter, he had planted the church and started it, was followed by a next pastoral leader whose name was Apollos. And people in that church apparently had now divided into an us versus them camp. Some saying, I belong to Paul, and others saying, I belong to Apollos. In other words, the church in Corinth had divided into two conflicting parties. There was the Paul party, there was the Apollos party. And Paul was writing to help heal those divisions. It's actually something he called spiritual immaturity. Part of his address to the problem comes not, after, not long after this passage that we hear. 
It's that extraordinarily beautiful chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We hear it so often read at wedding ceremonies, that chapter on love. If I speak with the tongues of mortals or of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. Before that, we have this wonderful extended metaphor that Paul uses frequently of the Christian movement, the church, and being a Christian is to be a member of a spiritual body. He, he uses the physical body as a metaphor. All of the parts are different, but they are connected, working together, each with their different gifts and skills and abilities, diverse but united, different functions, jobs, approaches. And right before the familiar words of communion that we heard today, one of the things that Paul blasts the Corinthians about is how they practice communion or how they don't practice communion, in his opinion. He tells them immediately after these verses. We stopped at verse 26. Verse 27 is Paul saying they are experiencing God's judgment because some of them are, quote, partaking unworthily, partaking unworthily. Woo, that drips with judgment, doesn't it? <laughs> partaking unworthily of the Lord's Supper, saying all who eat or drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment. Just like Jesus, Paul was not one to mince words. Now that's a difficult phrase. That is a very difficult phrase that has sadly been misconstrued and, I think, badly broadened to implicate any number of things. One, that you must share a particular theology about what happens here to quote-unquote discern the body. Or more often, I have heard it used from traditions that say to consume unworthily is implying that you, need, you have a personal moral failing. You have a personal sinfulness, one that must be confessed and expunged before you can partake worthily of the bread or the cup in this presumably more purified state. I disagree with both of those because I prefer to agree with Paul as I read Paul who wrote those words. Paul was very specific about what he didn't like and what he believed the body was. In the early church, communion, or the Lord's Supper, as they called it, was a full meal, more or less a potluck or a hosted meal in someone's home that everyone would gather and share, a full meal that was shared in community, which included the bread and cup, of course. What Paul disliked what Paul said God was judging them about in community was that there are those who gathered for their weekly worship that were able to come early and began eating the meal early. And those who would have been able to come early were those who would have been people of more means or wealth or free persons that would come early and begin sharing the meal. And by the time those who had to come later because they were enslaved or they had other jobs or were simply unable to, they would arrive and there wouldn't be any meal left for them. It was clear to Paul that to eat unworthily was not to wait to share equally with your sisters or your brothers not recognizing that the bread that is shared at communion is the bread of just and equal sharing. To discern the body had little to nothing to do with the bread or the cup itself. To discern the body was to discern the body of Christ, the body of Christ being the gathered community spiritual body. To consume lacking the 
that awareness is what Paul believed was to consume unworthy. Communion, not a personal or private spiritual act, but a shared act of justice, of God's reign on earth that had come. And it had become an expression of injustice. There's a story from a number of years ago about a small village in Latin America, where there was a lively and flourishing peasant Christian community, their own thriving peasant Christian house church. And the local wealthy landover, landowner, the hacienda owner, asked if he could be part of their celebration of the Eucharist. And he was welcomed to join them. And he was welcomed with a reminder. And he was reminded that if he chose to share the bread and cup of communion with the peasants from whom he exploited labor, he couldn't stop at the table if he shared bread and cup with them. The sharing of labor had to begin with the shared bread and cup of communion. The sharing of justice began at the table. He was welcome to share, but he had to realize and right the inequities that were happening beyond. shared this quote by theologian Frederick Herzog before, and it challenges even MCC's wide open theology of communion. If the hunger of the world is disassociated from the bread and cup of the Eucharist, we celebrate close. If the bread and the cup of the Eucharist is disassociated from the hunger of the world, we still celebrate closed communion. When we take the bread and cup of communion, do we do so with our eyes and our hearts and our spirits open to the demand that it become a just and equal sharing? Will we do it perfectly? Of course not. It is unlikely, indeed impossible, to do without God's help. I think maybe that's why the bread at communion is broken. Because it's a table not just of healing. It's a table that acknowledges and bears witness to brokenness. Healing that comes through brokenness, shared brokenness, with the shared promise of healing. I'm glad to remember that every Sunday is World Communion Sunday in MCC. Because every Sunday, every MCC is celebrating communion around the world. So when we do that this Sunday in particular, what body do you discern? With whom do you share communion today, even if by yourself, physically in your home, with whom are you sharing communion? Not just you, not just your partner or loved one or people that are like you or people that you like in the room. Widen your circle of consciousness. Expand your heart and your spirit. You are invited into communion. You are always invited into communion with a spiritual body that embraces the world. Not just MCCers in 
Finland and Italy and Australia and Toronto, MCCers in the Philippines, in Brazil, in Kenya, every Sunday, not just MCC. Do we celebrate communion in that wide spiritual sense with those who are walking and running in the marathon today, with those who walked in the marches for reproductive justice yesterday, young and old people alike who are isolated and think that their lives are not worth living, those in Haiti who are still waiting for relief from their suffering. Today, your communion may be personal, but I want to challenge you to make it global. A meal that not only connects you to the presence of God in Christ, but a moment that connects you to all of the children of God. And that's all. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Help me. And now we gather together for the prayers of the people. Here in MCC Portland, we have books at the front of the sanctuary where you can write your prayers, and also you can submit them online. So uh, if you could please join me in prayer. Heavenly Creator, Christ, and Eternal Spirit, we pray today for that one number that is now in our consciousness. 700,000 people who have perished from the coronavirus, COVID-19 virus. May we continue to have the strength to endure and fight in order to keep our loved ones healthy. And also may we grow patient and generous for our brothers and sisters who are holding on to false beliefs. May we also learn to recognize the false beliefs that we have within ourselves, Lord, and not judge others for their beliefs as well. Judge, judge we not those folks out there, Lord. And also, I uplift a prayer for guilt, Your Honor, guilt, Your Honor, guilt, Lord. Guilt, Your Honor. <laughs> I am thinking about work tomorrow and it's not going away from my head. Lord, let me be here present in this moment. Pray, we pray, we pray. No, but I want it, but what I wanted, what I wanted to say in that prayer and it came out in my words in a convoluted way is that sometimes we hold on to guilt mm. as if we have committed a crime yeah. that we have not committed. So we pr I, the special prayer for me today for all of us is that we absolve ourselves for that which we are not guilty of. Mm -hmm. Take responsibility for that that you have done, but do not burden yourself with the pain of something you have not done. Amen.
Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Enrique, I am so gratified that I'm not the only one that stumbles over my words <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> yes, that, yes, Your Ooh. Honor. What? Mercy. Ooh, I like that a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I want to take a few moments and tell you some of what's going on in the life, uh, other than this foolishness, no. some, of, <laughs> some of the other foolishness that's going on with the life of MCC Portland. We do deliver an e-newsletter to you weekly if we have your correct email address. It's also posted on our church Facebook page. And we do have a few paper copies here on site if you want to pick one up on the lobby, in the lobby before you leave. But it tells you um, a lot of the things that happen in the life of our community and some of the things that I forget to say out loud. So it's always good to check the e-newsletter. If you find yourself in need of some extra support now or at some time in the future, I do encourage you to reach out to our congregational life team via email or via phone. We are here to provide caring conversation or prayer or referrals to resources if you have a need that exceeds what we're able to do at MCC Portland. And to that end, I do want to point out as you go through the lobby, you will find, I should have had one in front of me, there are the small green Street Roots resources booklets. I'm wondering, Brian, are you looking for one? If you could pull one up. There are multiple copies of those, and I encourage you, if you or someone you might know, oh, thank you, good sir. You can just stand there and turn on it. Pick one up on your way out. If you or someone, well, if you're online, you can't quite do that, but they do have them online. Uh, you can pick up one of the resource guides, and if you or someone you know has a special need, it's a great tool mm. to just find a resource for someone that you may be able to assist. Also, Every week on Thursday at 6.30 p.m. online, we have our Zoom Bible study. We are working our way through four of the books of wisdom in Scripture. We are, this week is our third and final week in Proverbs. Next week, we begin Ecclesiastes. And then following that, we'll be spending three weeks on Job. There's a detailed reading schedule that's attached to the e-newsletter, so you can print that off. You can join us at any time, and it tells you what portions we'll be sharing on what Thursday evenings. We're having a great time. It's a different format than I have done for our online Thursday studies, but I'm thoroughly enjoying it, and you are welcome to join us any Thursday. As I mentioned in passing during the sermon, this coming Saturday, we will be observing our annual Blessing of the Animals in recognition of the Feast of St. Francis, that beloved saint on so many, in so many ways, but particularly beloved because of how he treasured his fellow creatures of creation. So we'll be celebrating that brief service on the porch, that's what it's called, the patio outside here on site at noon on Saturday from noon to about 12.30. You're welcome to bring your beloved companion animal. And if your companion animal cannot travel or if it is now a blessed memory, you're welcome to bring a picture for blessing at that blessing as well this Saturday at noon. And a reminder, coming up in a month, Sunday, October 31st, is our annual congregational meeting. At our annual meetings, we do a lot of important business. Not only do we vote on next year's budget, we vote on members of the board of directors. And at this congregational meeting, we have a few proposed changes to our local bylaws. So I encourage you to plan ahead to attend our congregational meeting. And all are welcome to attend. Members can vote, but guests and observers are always present at our meeting. All of this, the community of MCC is possible because of God's grace and because of your support, your generosity of spirit, being present, 
and through the generosity of your financial giving. So we prepare now to worship God with the giving of our offerings. Online, you can use the link that's provided in the comments section. You can use the giving button on our Facebook page. You can send your offering directly to 2828 Southeast Stevens Street. You can automate your offering to be sent, which I have done, which I find tremendously uh, convenient and a comfort for me. And if you are on site, you can certainly place your offering in the offering plate at any time before you leave, or you can use your credit or debit card to make your offering at the donation station in the lobby. Please pray with me as we worship with our offering. God, you are so good to us. I'm reminded in this moment that the openness of our experience of communion is a reflection of the openness of your heart and spirit toward us. You are always feeding us, nourishing us in real, tangible ways and in ways that are only experienced by our spirit. From that, we rise in gratitude and we respond in gratitude, giving this portion back as a gift of thanksgiving. God, we pray for all of those gifts that have been given already, those that are being given in this moment, and those who are preparing to give, that these gifts might be blessed and multiplied not only to strengthen our community, but so that our community can serve and strengthen others. In your holy name, and in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 27 years ago, I wrote this song in its entirety in three minutes. Up on the hilltop Saw a crowd gathered round, tired and hungry. From what the day had shown them, up on the hilltop there he was, bringing his brand of love to them. You could see. Was all that I had some measly fish and bread was all I could give so I gave it away gave it away gave it away gave it away gave it away, gave it away. all I did was give it away On the hilltop there we were Staring in disbelief At his overconfidence So it seemed to me How could one man's hands Hold food for all Stood in disbelief. All I could give was all that I had. My measly words. All I did was give it away. Open wide, 
seeing all the food at his side. For all to eat, he said, come and eat with me. about 18 different ways going through my head about how this can go. <laughs> uh, Nathan asked me this morning if I thought this was my table or if it was God's table. I think every Sunday it's not necessarily my table, but it's a human table, not God's table. We make the choice what gets put on this table. Today I made the choice of about five of these elements. Nathan made the choice about three of four of them, of the bread and the cup. And somehow or another, most Sundays, when we're in church, when we're in this building or in a service in another church building, we take a damn piece of flat, nasty cracker. <laughs> can be transformed into the body of Christ. And it is. And it's not enough. Because it's, it's the Lord. We choose how we hear the word of Christ or God. Paul called it a loaf of bread. Closest word to the words coming out of Jesus' mouth. I suspect it was more like a tortilla. Unleavened bread at the Passover table. Except, what if the first communion was the feast of the 5,000? What if that? We absolutely need communion every Sunday. Absolutely. Every Sunday that I take communion in this sanctuary and over the 30-some years that I have been a member of this congregation, I have felt transformed in the taking of bread and cup at this table that becomes the table of God because we believe that. We transform it in our belief. And in our belief and in our assurity that God is present in this meal every Sunday, we offer that gift to anyone who walks through these doors or joins us online and it is because, actually, of this online service that I am more and more certain that God can be found in my favorite, favorite breakfast food, Captain Crunch. And that sounds silly. I know it does, but I have had Captain Crunch as it has been transformed mm. into the body of Jesus. Hmm, all that good sugar. But when I eat Captain Crunch, I remember our honeymoon, where for some silly reason we bought our favorite childhood cereals and had them at midnight for dessert. And there was nothing more sacred in my marriage mm. than my mother. <laughs> this 
gifts from our brothers and sisters from south of the border. It's a Harito, an orange drink. The best thing about it is how sugar. It is the blood of Jesus because we make it so. So whether you're drinking a cup of coffee this morning or stuck to your saucer, whether you are having a Red Bull for that extra charge of Jesus, <laughs> extra wings, or that extra special filling, chocolate. <laughs> it is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ set for you given to you given to all of us because we are created in the image of God and worthy of the meal and let us never forget as we look at this abundant table this morning it includes one healthy apple mm -hmm. that there are people who are starving in our country in our country sometimes they're starving because we're so entitled that we give them wonder bread and donuts as donations rather than apples and lettuce and whole grains. There are people starving all over the world because they don't even get that. It's not enough, and it is more than enough. And we carry that truth in us. And I think sometimes that's what Jesus wants us to carry in us. Jesus is enough, but if we only keep Jesus in our own body, Jesus is not enough. On that night when Jesus was betrayed, on that afternoon, when Jesus was on that mountain with those people who were so desperate to hear what Jesus had to say, but they couldn't hear because they were so hungry, <laughs> Jesus took bread, broke it, and transformed it into the body of Jesus so that it fed 5,000 people. Each time we break bread, let us feed 5,000 people. Let us feed 5,000 people by the giving of Jesus Christ through us. I don't know what Jesus gave them to drink, if anything. Scripture doesn't tell us, so why not a harito? Why not my favorite mandarin harito from Mexico? Why not? Jesus took the cup on that last supper, blessed it and said to each person gathered there and all those who would hear the words in the generations to come. Be poured out for you. Each time you drink of this, remember me. For those of us in the sanctuary, cup down, the little lid down, and it separates, and you will find that skinny wafer on top. It is now transformed in its fullness to sustain you and to nourish you. And yeah, you can make a funny face, and, but it has been transformed in the juice. My brothers and sisters online, my brothers and sisters and all people gathered in this place and online and who've yet to hear the word of Jesus, your meal, whatever that may be today, is transformed 
to be all that you need. And it is also all that the people need if you will share it. Take, eat, and drink. And remember Jesus. Amen. God of my heart, nothing surpasses the love you impart. You, my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, your presence, my love. soda which you should take with okay um everything all of the all of the breads and the beverages are free for the taking um what we have here there's the apple there's tortilla there's a paratha which is an indian flatbread there's a croissant there's cornbread there's a donut there's a bagel feel free to have some here or take some home and share that abundance with, for yourself or with others that you might find at home and along the way. So, we're almost done, but not quite. Take a moment if you're online and continue to connect with one another, check in as we do here. 
while we're here. We do offer the gift of prayer on site. Philip will be up front with the rainbow stole. If you want some personal prayer over any matter, you can check in with Philip about that. All right, beloved friends, sisters, and brothers, let us recall we have not just watched church. We have not just, yes, we have not just been to church. I, this is so jazzy. I like, I gotta figure out some, I gotta figure out some choreography. We are the church. <laughs> Go in peace, sharing love and peace with one another.